Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overall Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In a previous video, I introduced a line of aerospike engines. The largest, this one, was meant to lift a Starship fully fueled into orbit and thereby saving me the trouble of refueling it in orbit. And uh, of course, I want to be able to do further testing with Starship, in which case I don't want to go through the whole refueling procedure. So anyway, it was just an expedient, but it was an expedient with... Uh, an interesting side note in that here we have uh, air spike with 36 M1 thrust chambers arrayed and we would like to of course recover it and everything in the previous video I had strap on uh, fuel tanks so it wasn't exactly single stage to orbit it was like one and a half stage to orbit but I wanted to create a full fuel tank that incorporated that and allowed this to be a proper single stage to orbit system so this video is about uh, testing my line of air spikes and testing their SSTO capacity, single stage to orbit capacity. So the, S, uh, the air spike line is the ED7 line. Here we are. Uh, the ones it is the this one is the ED7M with the M1 engines. Uh, we also have an ED7J with J2 engines and an ED7R with RL10 engines. So uh, there we go. We are going to uh, try those out and see their capacity. This would obviously be the coup de gras, if you will. Uh, so we'll save it for last. I've called the tank, the stage Daenerys. I mean, it's actually the tank plus the engine. The engine on its own, by the way, is 326 tons, larger than most rockets. But, you know, it provides, oh, uh, in vacuum, 28,000 tons of thrust. It gets 17,000 tons off the ground. Uh, but... I called it Daenerys because of the fuel tank, and that is because it's the mother of all dragons, as you can see. I mean, obviously, uh, this is a Game of Thrones reference for those who don't know. Uh, mother of all dragons, yes, I decided to shape it this way. And of course, we have Starship on top, because the goal is to, once again, have a fully fueled Starship delivered to orbit, uh, and then, in an SSTO style, and then potentially bring this back down. Bringing it back down is going to be tricky. We can't really use the engines because they can't throw down. I mean, even if we shut off uh, one-ninth of the chambers, which is probably the most we could get away with, uh, that would still not be enough to throw down enough because the, this tank is four, has 4% 4 dry mass. And so if you can throw this down to one-ninth, that would still be a thrust-to-weight ratio of like 3 uh, so that's a little bit rough. Anyway, uh, so 4% dry mass, that's still a higher dry mass than the shuttle external tank, but we do have the heat tiles and all. The heat tiles amount to more than 80 tons, uh, so the, th the full thermal protection system on here. And that is larger than the mass of the shuttle, the space shuttle. Uh, so the entire space shuttle, not just the shuttle's thermal protection system, uh, we basically have as heat tiles. So, yep, it's big, and then there's Starship. But let's save this for last. First, we'll start off with the SSTO capacity test for the smallest one, the one with the RL-10s. This one is sort of cute. Its total mass is less than that of the M1 engine uh, uh, air spike, the ED-7M. It's only 281 tons with all the fuel and the... RL-10 engine there. The RL-10s do not have a very good thrust weight ratio, but hampering them even more is the fact that they have a fairly low chamber pressure and I don't think you can increase it. Uh, I accidentally left in here set at 1200 PSI. That's wrong. Uh, actually, I did not assume that these were at, running at 1200 PSI. I was uh, I gave them just their regular PSI. So uh, the with the chamber pressure being low, the sea level thrust weight ratio tends to be low and the sea level ISP as well. So that hampers it a little bit. Uh, this tank is 14.67 uh, tons dry, 262 wet. Uh, the engine itself is, I believe, 10 tons. Yeah, 10.8 tons. And the payload we are aiming for is 8 tons. 8 tons to orbit SSTO style. So we'll see. You can see that oops, the we've got 3,000 uh, sorry, 9,216 meters per second 
that may or may not be enough with a 1.15 sea level thrust weight ratio. It's tough to say because we're not staging and everything. So we'll find out. Okay, here we go. So again, 8 tons to orbit is the goal, but we don't know if it'll manage it. Uh, everything is on. Ignition. Oh, that's peculiar. Oh, it's refueling the liquid on? Um, let's launch. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was going like, it's only depleting the hydrogen. Why? But I guess... I, I don't know why it was only depleting the hydrogen. Maybe it couldn't supply enough through the clamps? We may have an imbalance at the end then. I don't know. Interesting plume they gave it. I just used the RS-25 plume, but... This is what it looks like. Uh, I might have turned a little bit too quickly. And we don't have a lot of gimbling on this. The plume does look better on this smaller one than it does on the larger one, though. I wonder how many particles it has. Uh, only 1,700. Not looking too bad. Ah, uh, we're not going to make it this time. Okay, yeah, there's already a fait accompli with our Delta V the way it is. Let me try launching a little bit differently. I think I was too shallow. Okay, I am getting the feeling that we're not going to be getting 8 tons to orbit, we'll, but we'll try again. Ignition. And this time we shouldn't wait quite so long. And launch. Because the clamps don't seem to refuel it properly. Okay, this might be steeper than I should have done. Past the speed of sound, finally. It actually took quite a long time. Goes without saying that we are experiencing quite a lot of drag on this. That's one thing that complicates matters as far as figuring out how much delta V we need to pack to get to orbit as well. The other thing being that we are not doing normal staging. Okay, yeah, um, not the best trajectory still, but we're about 400 meters per second short, and I don't think... Uh, maybe if we release the fairings, it'd help a little bit earlier. Um, though, considering the shape of the body, releasing the fairings is actually dicey. But we'll see. Uh, yep, I think we'll reduce the payload a little bit. That's not too surprising. This was overly ambitious for an SSTO in the first place. We're talking about 8 tons on two point, uh, 281 tons. That's uh, not quite 3%, but it's close to 3%. So, yeah. That's ambitious. The fairing size, by the way, is 2.44 meters. That's uh, the diameter of a delta 2, so not very big. It doesn't really change our delta V that much. In fact, uh, even if we really reduce this, the dry mass of this body is sort of overwhelming, right? And the engine. What we do with the payload is sort of almost trivial, marginal. Let's try for 2% exactly, so 5.5 tons. I'm just looking at it and I'm going like, well, we're not getting 400 meters per second more, right? Uh, otherwise, I'd like to get 6 tons, but maybe we should be more reasonable. So 5.5. And that'll be around 2%. The fairing mass, it's only 0.163 tons, so it's not that big a deal. Again, considering the mass of all this. Of course, the trouble is that we want to bring this back. If we didn't want to bring it back, uh, an SSTO would be easy. We could use balloon tanks and everything. Alright, ignition. And launch. It is a nice plume, actually. 
Uh, still not there. Let's let go of the fairings just for the heck of it. Uh, oof, that was close. It's like riding the side of it. And if we have to put parachutes on this, it's going to be even worse. Overall, this RL10 version is not the best thing. Okay, yeah, even that doesn't quite work out. We didn't even get the apoapsis into space particularly, but um, yeah, I feel oppressed by this small scale. We need we need to take advantage of larger scale because to some extent the volume increases by the cube, but the structural mass will increase by the square because it's just on the surface. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but at least uh, certainly the heat shielding increases by the square of the diameter so we can take advantage of that to some extent uh, let's see if scaling up will help with the j2 version this is quite a bit larger as you can see and let's take a look at the masses so here we have the air spike with the j2s 50.4 tons the nice thing about the j2s is they're very light and these are modeled after the j2s's and again the mass is assumed to be the mass of the full J2S. Really, this part of the nozzle is only the top part of what the real engine would have had, and then the rest of the mass is assumed to be part of the spike. And that's a, sim a simplification, but it's a little bit difficult to figure out how to measure it otherwise. So we are going with that for now. Uh, so it's got the thrust of 36 J2s and the uh, mass of 36 J2s. If you really wanted to think of it as just putting 36 J2s on here, that's probably okay. Um, the only difference being that we've got better sea level ISP. So that's the thing. We uh, Vacuum ISP is a little bit better also because we're assuming that the J2s are slightly uprated in terms of chamber pressure given modern materials technology. So this one, we do have operated chambers. Uh, so that's 50 tons down there. And then the tank here is 99.24 tons. So that's closer to 5% of the wet mass. And again, part of that is the heat shielding and far above the space shuttle's external tank. Here uh, we are, I mean, the space shuttle's external tank is about 26 tons and that carries about a third of this amount of fuel. It's about 700 tons, 760 tons uh, wet. So we're talking about that would be, that would weigh 70-ish, uh, 75-ish uh, tons, whereas this weighs 99 tons in order to account for the heat shielding. So depends how you look at it, but here, we have our payload, which is 125 tons, which is optimistic, I think. Maybe I should shade it a little bit lower because of what we just experienced. Uh, that's like 5%. Um, and again, the J2Ss are really lightweight engines. The J2X, I didn't model after the J2X because the J2X is like double the mass of a J2. So uh, the original J2, I mean. The J2S is a little bit heavier than the regular J2. But the J2X, for some reason or another, was is like double the mass, which is not great. Oh, 5% is only 109? Jeez. Okay, let's, let's go for 108 tons. I don't know how we're managing this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, last time I was... Uh, it was tough to get the delta V. You notice our high thrust weight ratio too. It was tough to get the delta V out of the RL tens with with a two percent payload, but scaling up does help. I I just I don't see any numbers that are wrong wrong. So okay. Hmm. I do want to do this as legitimately as possible. That nine thousand three hundred meters per second with that thrust weight ratio should definitely get us to orbit. I just feel a little bit weird about having... Well, let's make it around 109 then. Okay. We will see. Still feel a little bit strange about this. Maybe I'll downrate these J2s instead of having such a high sea level ISP. Okay, here we go. Our up, SAS is on. Ignition.
And launch. We've got a lot of get up and go here. Okay, we should be through max Q now. Proceeding very smoothly. Plume looks okay. I mean, maybe it could be bigger. Really gets truncated at this point. Okay, we are getting close to orbit. At least given our high G's, we get a lot of thrust weight ratio. We're at the end here. Okay, 242 by 140. Let's get rid of the fairings. We're 266 tons in orbit and the payload is... Whoop. Okay, camera, what are you doing? Is, uh, well, we don't have MechJib on here, but it's 109 tons. Let's get back to the body. Okay, let's see if the RCS thrusters work. Alright, well, I'm gonna have to RCS my way to deorbit and we'll see whether that works out. But this is definitely a feeling a bit OP. I need to nerf this thing. I mean, our mass on the pad was the same as SLS. Now, of course, SLS has SRBs, which are not very efficient and everything, and that's actually most of the pad mass of the rocket. But still, being able to bring SLS's payload up here as a single stage to orbit system, I don't know. Yeah, it's a little bit dodgy. Now, we haven't put the parachutes on yet. That's a whole other business. That'll be a lot more mass. Oh, we'll close this up. Shut down the engine. Lower shield. Oh. Oh, we lost communication. Shoot. Okay, well, we'll have to wait until we get communication back, I suppose. These RCS thrusters seem alright. They're at 4 kilonewtons. They're pretty big, physically. No, these aren't 4 kilonewtons, I take it back. Uh, these are 2 kilonewtons. The ones on the M1 tank are 4 kilonewtons. Better take a look at our communication line. I want to make sure we turn retrograde before we hit the atmosphere, because we're going to be hitting the atmosphere soon. Otherwise, this would certainly go in nose first. Okay. I don't want that line to be too stretched. All right. I think 75 will do the trick. Especially from this low orbit. So, actually surface negative. Of course, we don't have the parachutes, so this is going to not survive. But the question is, does it not survive before we hit the water or land? Or does it survive? Does it, you know, dest get destroyed earlier than that? I went with a uh, heat tile thing, and that's probably controversial. I don't know if we could do heat tiles given this mass on this surface area. It'd be nice. <laughs> it is a huge empty tank. It does have the engine cluster at the bottom though. Diameter of this is something like 22 meters. So it's about 22 meters in diameter here. The M1 tank is 44 meters in diameter, I believe. 43, 44. So these are not small surface areas. What does FAR say about it? 401 meters squared. Is that right? No, oh, uh, that's a radius of 11.3 meters. So, yeah. Our ballistic coefficient is... 0.388 tons per meter squared. I don't have the shuttle's full surface area. I do have its wing area, though. So, taking its empty weight by its wing area, let's say, that gets it to 0.312. So it probably had a better 
number than a lower number than that, uh, lower mass to surface area ratio than that. So we're, we are heavy, but are we too heavy for this system? I don't know. Maybe we have more advanced tiles. Well, at this point, I'm wondering whether the electric charge will last long enough. A power draw of three kilowatts is probably... Oh, wait, that's... Um, no, that's three kilowatts, all right. It's not because of time warp. Uh, that might be a little bit high. I could consider dropping that down a little bit. I don't think we need larger batteries on here. We are out of power. That's interesting. I wonder what's taking up so much power. Because I didn't set it to use 3 kilowatts. I had it using 0 0.6, which makes sense. Maybe the comms trying to do something? I don't know. Yeah, it seems to be using more than I told it to use. Uh, we're not slowing down very well. We may need some air brakes of some kind. We may need to have panels on the side. I thought about building this for uh, Mars Lander too. Have panels on the side that flip out. It's not as good as uh, inflatable heat shield, but it's more convenient. We will add the appropriate mass for that, of course. This seems obviously too hot for heat tiles, I think. So adjustments will need to be made to this system to make it more legit. And then the parachutes. Okay, so we're through the worst of it. This will destroy itself in the surface of possibly the ocean. But let's move on to the big one. Okay, here we are, the main event, Starship on Daenerys. And of course we launched Starship using this engine before, we didn't quite make it, but now we've got this new tank. And when I, you know, talking about nerfing the J2 uh, tank and that system, still, you know, in a way I've tried to do this legitimately. I used the external tank of the space shuttle as basis and then added a whole bunch of heat shielding and calculated how much the heat shielding would be. Uh, so yeah, I've tried, but it, it does sort of unsettle me the numbers. They're a little bit too optimistic and so that's why, but it's not inconceivable. It, the problem is that we're used to the mass ratios for smaller systems, right? We're used to, like, for a Titan rocket, 3 meter diameter or whatever, and, or, you know, a Delta IV, a 5 meter diameter. But when you scale up to this size, we don't really have a whole lot of experience as to how light we can make it. You know, SpaceX is trying to make a 9 meter tank, and we'll see how that goes. The Saturn V had a 10.1 meter tank. So we can have some basis with that, though the technology probably has moved on since they built those. Um, this is a 42 meter diameter bottom. Uh, this diameter up here, or I think it might be 46. I have to, I'll have to take a look at Blender. Um, I sized it based on the previous stage. Basically, this envelops both the previous center tank and the boosters, right? So it's the whole thing. And it compares fairly well to the dry mass of that system too. But as you'll see, because, you know, otherwise we'll have a ridiculous excess of delta V when we get to orbit. And as long as we don't have a ridiculous excess of delta V when we get to orbit, it'll end up being about the same as those procedural tanks, right? So yeah. Uh, this top diameter is, I think, 23 meters or something like that. So, yep. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I'll probably... I might keep this one as it is. If it turns out it just gets Starship into orbit fully fueled, because I want to do stuff with Starship, and I don't want to have to fuel it all the time. So that's my motivation for this one. 
but the J2 one might be a little bit nerfed. All right, so here we go with this. Okay, here we go, the Mother of Dragons, SAS on, Thrall is up, and Ignition. And launch. Pretty healthy liftoff. Do need to fix those plumes. Looking at the plumes on the RL-10 one, it's pretty clear that we can get better plumes on here. It's actually sort of impressive how well the pods work in terms of just the drag. I mean, obviously we lose some more to drag than we otherwise would, but not as much as you would think, perhaps. Maybe pod stages are the way of the future. Okay, well, it will be tight. Not too sure how it'll shake up. Shake out. Yeah, it is tight. Of course, in this case, Starship could complete orbit with a little bit of fuel. That would be helpful of it. Okay, it looks like it'll be not quite, which will once again be down to trajectory optimization, maybe. Tough to say. Now, Starship is not carrying any payload. We could underfuel it, of course. Let's reserve some to have it control itself on the way back down, though I probably won't record that. Starship. can complete orbit. It's got 8,000 meters per second right now without any payload. So, uh, of course, it does have the crew cabin here. That's uh, a good 20 tons, I think. So... But it could easily, without the payload, transfer to the moon, land on the moon, and take off again. It's nearly a thousand tons. Can't even imagine how many parachutes we need for this. Okay, here we go. Once again, we're coming in mighty fast compared to what I would like. And I will actually reduce the heat tolerance on these tanks. I think. Because I think it should explode at this point. <laughs> so, I have my standards. It, it should probably explode. It's, it's, it's up there, but I, th I feel like it should explode. Alright, well, with this peaking out at about 9 Gs. And getting down to Kerbin orbit velocities. And realizing that I have a little bit of work to do to make all this stuff a little bit more realism overhaul-y instead of uh, what's going on here. I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.